Okay, I just wanted to speak um, a bit about the steps you should follow when you're first looking at your magnetic data. So I've got tips on like what menus to use and stuff like that, but before that starts, just a, a broader picture of the different things you should be looking at. And really, I've only done this once or twice, I'm not the expert on this at all, so I'm just sharing the little that I have learned. Um, please comment below if you've got more that you want to add to it, I'm sure people have some great ideas. And so this was a study that I was doing in the southern region of South Africa, so here's South Africa, and you can see this big magnetic stripe here that's called the BT magnetic anomaly. And so I was trying to look at it, and so the layout of this paper, um, I, I really followed a, a fellow student who was doing a PhD up ahead of me, and she had some great, just a great layout in her paper. So I followed it quite closely without bordering of plagiarism, and um, just her, her workflow um, really helped a lot with me to understand. And so I started out with just looking at a broader regional picture. And so, 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 so often we zoom into our area and we don't just try and understand the larger tectonics that are affecting the area and just the setting, tectonic settings of our region. And so I plotted, the, the here on the left is magnetic data, on the right is the free air data, and below here is the bouquet data. Over here is the isostatic anomaly, gravity isostatic anomaly, I'm not going to talk too much about that. And then I marked the boundaries of the different tectonic provinces. You can see here we've got a craton, here's a mobile belt, and then we've got a younger fold belt in the south. And I was lucky that I had these regions delineated by my supervisor. She gave me the shape files, but it's really not hard to create shape files for your area. And there's no excuse not to have these on your maps. Um, I'm pretty sure I've got some uh, movies on how to uh, create shape files in Geosoft. Um, if not, I'll, I can go back and create some and I'll try, if I've got them already, I'll put the link um, in the details below this video. And so you can see here, this strong magnetic anomaly lies mostly in this Namaqua Natal mobile belt. So it's a younger Proterozoic belt. And it just helps you to see some of the features across the data sets. Mainly what you're obviously seeing in free air is the topography. You're seeing here is the edge of the escarpment of South Africa. Um, the reason why I had the free air was to, because I was moving on to the isostatic anomaly. But most of the time people just look at the magnetic data on the left here, or the TMI, total magnetic intensity, and then the Bouguet anomaly here. And you can see how well this edge of the craton correlates with this low on the craton. Okay, so just a map that gives you the settings. And then I moved down, let's just shift down a bit, um, those were some magnetic susceptibility data. So thankfully in South Africa we have an atlas of susceptibility values from across the country and I just use those to create some tables of the different rock types and what their susceptibility values would be. Ideally you've got some from your sample area, if not unfortunately you will have to use susceptibilities from textbook values. Um, and some, I went to a workshop recently that actually said plotting rock type against susceptibility is not the best method. You can see there's such broad ranges that there's actually, you should have a ternary diagram that also takes into account the composition of the rock, because not all rocks, not all granites are the same, um, but I can't expand more on that here. So maybe, hopefully in the future, we can upgrade our uh, physical property plots. And then I moved on here, I zoomed in a bit to my area, but I'm actually, um, and so on top here, I've got the magnetic susceptible, uh, sorry, the total magnetic intensity, so the magnetic map. And then underneath here, I did a high pass filter. Um, and so the whole point of it is that in my area, this BT anomaly that I was looking at is so strong that it kind of swamps out all surrounding anomalies. Except on the coast here, you see a bit of a strong anomaly on the right hand side here, which is called the Williston. Below is the Mbashi. And you really don't see if they continue at all. But as soon as I did this high pass filter, it took away just the dominating feature that was the BT and actually allowed me to show that there was continuity on the Williston anomaly um, and on the Mbashi. So filtering really just helps maybe sometimes take out your big signals that may be a regional and help you see some of the, the smaller signals in there. And I was able to draw these lineaments. Um, it also allowed me to see 
Um, but you can see it on the magnetics as well, that this magnetics over here is quite different from this on the right hand side here. And so that there's actually a divide here between the two terrains. I wasn't the first person who said this, it's actually based on borehole data, but the filters also helped you to easily see. On the right hand side you've got these long anomalies, whereas on the in the west here you've got these shorter wavelength anomalies or smaller features. So that's what filtering helps, but that's not the best figure to see this. Um, if we go down here, so now I'm focusing on the east coast of South Africa. This is a plot that I really like and that, um, like I said, I got from the um, other student, just the suggested order. So this is zooming in on the coast. Here's this BT anomaly I was talking about. Here's the Williston anomaly. And this is the normal magnetic data. And these black lines are shear zones. And you can see that this mapped shear zone, the black lines on surface, correlate very well with these high magnetic anomalies. And then on the right hand side, what I did here was a low pass filter. So previously I had the high pass filter showed me the continuity. Here the low pass filter is showing me um, what deep features they are. So it's blocking out the shallow high frequency stuff and it's showing you what are your deep anomalies. And you can see this shear zone here, which is the boundary between the craton and the protozoic, is strong, so it's very deep. Um, here's your BT is also deep, but you're still getting these other shear zones um, showing that they are deep features, they're not just shallow features. The other thing that I did down here is the tilt derivative, and you can see how much detail it brings up of these shear zones. I'm not going to talk too much here about the pseudo gravity, mainly because I've forgotten. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're just different filters. I mean, you could also do your vertical derivative um, to understand your shadow features and your tilt derivative to under shadow understand your shadow features and then your low pass filter to understand what is deep in your area. And really at this point in time, you're just trying to understand what signals are there um, so you can understand better what the heck you're going to be modeling when you go into 3D. Another thing that I've never done, but a colleague of mine did, so I wanted to share it here, is she created this map of her study area. Unfortunately, I don't have the original mag, but you can see she picked up linear features, and this was in GSF. And so I asked her for how she did it, and so it's, you can see here, it's, this is that GSF how to guide CET grid analysis, creating structural complexity maps. And they've got a great image here, um, that you can see here is the mag, and then here are these lineaments that they have um, delineated and put on top, and then you can create a map of those lineaments, which is pretty much what uh, my colleague did. So that's also just a great way of um, showing people lineaments in your area. I think it also might help, um, you could plot these types of lineaments on maybe the gravity data and see how they compare with each other. So that's another thing you can do playing around with your data. Um, then you obviously want to look towards depth estimates. And in Geosoft, it's very tempting to use the Euler 3D because it is there. But I think something I've learned from my, my master's and my PhD is don't jump to 3D too quickly. Start on 2D. 2D makes a world of difference just helping you understand before you get too much data that it's just hard to understand. And so um, I do have a video of some free 1D Euler software. Um, and so really, I can honestly say I used the Euler 3D in Geosoft um, during my PhD, but never actually published the data because it made no sense to me. Um, and maybe I also just ran out of time. And so don't use it too quickly. Start here with this Euler um, 1D, or and it's really profile data. And it just helps you understand what is going on in this area. So this is the video here, Euler Software Potential Field Depth Estimates Along a Profile. It was developed by a professor at my university, Prof. Gordon Cooper, and the links here in the YouTube video take you to where you can download the software. And um, just to give you an example of what some of the things look like. So this is your magnetic data here in this black line. It's obviously over a dike, because this is a dark signal in South Africa. Um, it calculates the RTP data. Here are some of the gradients. And you can see here I've got um, oil depth estimates with, I would assume that the uh, black is 0 0.5 structural index, 
and one is the rates is one structural index. And you can see it's a bit complicated. I, it's, a, it's an easy model, so I would know that the top of the dark is here. Um, oh, sorry, the dark is, is the structural index of one, so it would be red, I think. I might be wrong. Um, but this is easy data. So Euler gets very confusing very quickly if it's complicated data. And you're not 100% sure of your structural index. So is it 0 0.5 for a contact? Is it 1 for a dark? Um, what is your window size? That um, depends on the gridding of your data or the station spacing of your data. So there's just a lot of different inputs that you've got to deal with. That that's why I would say understand a profile first. Understand what's going on in a profile of your data first before you jump to 3D. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any 3D videos because I didn't think to make them at the time and I no longer have access to that menu. But um, yeah, start, start with this first. Try this out. Try and let this make sense to you so that you can understand what parameters you can then plug in to the 3D data. And then you're going to look at things like modeling. Now, modeling is also very difficult. So let's zoom down here. So these were some models that I created using GMSYS in Geosoft. And so you can see on top here, this is a planned view of my magnetic, so I can see where my profile's going. This BMA over here is the BT magnetic anomaly. Over here I've got the magnetic data. Below I've got the gravity data, so you can see I'm not really seeing anything here. And then I created these models based on several data sets. Now that's the problem with magnetic modeling, is that nobody's going to believe your magnetic modeling unless you have other data sets to back it up. Borehole, seismics, I think I've got an MT here. So you can see scrolling down, this is um, seismic reflection data I had. This is seismic refraction data. This is some MT data. And you can see it's mostly based on the seismic here. And the different colors here represent up top here different susceptibilities and, and on the second model different densities. And so not much change in the densities here, that's why you're not seeing much. Um, and especially on the coast of South Africa, most of the gravity signal here is due to changes in the boho. And so I even, the, that's another set data set I brought in here was crystal thickness estimates. Because if you are trying to model crystal thickness and you're modeling gravity and you're modeling shallow stuff, nobody's going to believe you unless it's constrained by other data sets. And so don't jump too quickly to modeling if you don't have other data sets to help you. But yeah, but Geosoft is great because it can allow you to see all of this. It can allow you to display other images in the background. Um, to help you constrain your data, you can also um, it can also show time estimates, and so yeah, I suppose that's one of the last things you would be doing is modeling your data. So those are just some of the steps that you can take when you're interpreting your data. You can see I did a second profile with other magnetic data, and then this is just some data in an Antarctica because South Africa was connected to the Antarctic during um, Gondwana times. So just showing how the anomalies can continue there. So just putting your, your study into a broader global context. Um, but yeah, so those are some possible steps to follow while doing magnetic modeling. Good luck.